Hi, my name is Frank Filippetti. I'm here at the Power Station, New England. I'm here recording some drum tracks for Tune Track. This has been a gas for me because we get to hear a whole bunch of different kits in different parts of the room. And today we're going to explain some of what we're doing and why we're doing it. So to begin with, our main kit is in the, the ISO booth over there, but we started in the main room here. We did three kits in the main room, and now we're doing a couple kits in both ISO booths. Starting with microphones, I'm standing right here next to the uh, AT Audio-Technica 5045 microphone. This is actually a prototype. You can't buy this. This is something that's in my uh, collection, but uh, isn't available to the public. Back a few years ago, I had asked for a 5045 microphone in Omni pattern as opposed to cardioid. So they sent me these two, and uh, I've been using them ever since. We're using those for the far room, about 20, 30 feet from the kit. Placement was based on listening to Norman play and walking around various spots in the room um, to find out what sounded the best. So I came up with these two positions. The next thing we did was uh, we tried various surfaces. So we started putting the, the drums on the floor. Then we put the drums on a rug or carpet, as is normally done. And finally, uh, I had brought in um, a riser. We played with the different surfaces and we found that the riser by far had the most power. So we set up the kit with the risers, and then we moved to the other room. When we went to ISO, let's call that ISO A, ISO A we also used the risers, and in ISO B we decided to go with a tighter drum sound with the carpet on the floor and no riser. Okay, so before we move on to the other mics, uh, I want to call your attention to this little get up here. We have a Yamaha subwoofer and a Vox amplifier. We send the bass drum feed from the microphone into the Yamaha subwoofer. The idea there bringing the attack of and the sound of the uh, bass drum goes into the subwoofer and arrives here at the room microphones approximately the same time that it arrives at the bass drum mic it allows the room mics to pick up sound at the same instant that Norman is playing them. So I put the bass drum and the snare into these two devices. Now I have an instantaneous hit from the snare and the bass drum, which occurs simultaneously with their arriving at the room mics much quicker. It, it brings the room tighter and more focused on the drum kit, and two, by putting the, the subwoofer here, you get a bloom out here that you would never get from just a bass drum microphone coming in alone. These are generally placed in an area where I get a really good top and bottom that's somewhere near one or both of the room mics. So that's the concept behind that. I'm now here at what I'm calling my close room mics. Those are generally between five and 10 feet away from the kit. The Coles 4038 has a very unique characteristic that's really suited to drums. So in addition to using them for overheads, I also use them for the room here. These are in a figure eight pattern. So we're picking up what's in front and what's behind. The object here is I want these to pick up a decent left and right, but leave a hole in the middle for what's happening down here with the, with the bass drum and, and these microphones. Using figure eight means that this is a null point. So 
the mic's picking this and this, but this is picking up that. Then we go to the bass drum. 95% of the time on the bass drum, I will use an Audio-Technica uh, AT2500. What's interesting is Audio-Technica came out with a way to put the condenser and the dynamic in the same capsule. So you can see here, there are two microphones. There's the condenser microphone and the dynamic microphone. They're in one housing and the two capsules are sample aligned. In other words, what enters this capsule and this capsule are aligned so that there is no phase differences at all. So you never have to worry about your, your microphones getting the same signal in phase. Should there be a front head with a little hole, I'll place this in the hole. And in this case, we took the front head off because that's the sound we were looking for. I will almost invariably use a second condenser microphone, in this case a U47, about two or three feet back. The reason for that is to pick up that extra bloom that happens once the signal leaves the shell. That's outside the shell that that starts to bloom in the room. This other interesting box here is uh, the Yamaha Subkick. That just sits right outside the shell, or if, there's a, if there is a head on that, I put that against the, the head, and that, that allows that low end, which sometimes this picks up, but sometimes that picks up, and you can mix and match between the two. So what we've done now, we're standing here before we get into the, the internals of the kit, uh, you're wondering what all these microphones are, and, and what we're doing here is setting up for a Broadway session where we would have a bunch of percussion along with the drums, sometimes played by the drummer, sometimes played by a separate percussionist. But the idea is all of these mics would be open while recording the individual instruments so that room effect that you get when you do things live is still there, even if you're recording one drum at a time, versus just having a very sterile single microphone on an instrument. So that's part of the tune track technology and why it works so well. We also have around us, you will see these, the uh, Senken 100K mics. And those are used for my left, center, right, left surround and right surround microphones, which are used to capture this room. We're also used to capture that room when we record it out there. And that basically gives me the kit from an immersive perspective. So the, the idea of these microphones is not only to pick up the percussion in the kit, but to give you a sense that if you just use those microphones, you'd have what it sounds like in that room. This is our kit for kind of calling it a Broadway kit, but it can be used for anything. Basically, uh, my setup on this kit is not much different from the rock and roll kit and from the, uh, the kind of pop kit that we were doing in the in ISO B. And uh, the main difference between this and the other kits is the tightness that I'm looking for. I'm trying to get in tighter to the kit than I am in the pop world or in the rock and roll world. So my two overheads are my main drum sound. That's what I'm most looking forward to. I, I'm, this is where I'm capturing the drums. These other microphones 
are part of adding to that, but I don't want the sound to be a direct drum sound or a directly mic tom sound. I'm looking for the bloom that comes here. So you'll also notice that the microphones are a bit cockeyed from what your standard procedure is. Again, the idea here is I know when I finish recording that the snare drum is going to be in the center and I know that the bass drum is going to be in the center and I know the toms are going to wrap around the center and the same thing with the overheads and the hi-hat I want close in the center to the, to the snare. I don't want the hi-hat appearing all the way over here and I don't want the snare, the bass drum being on the right or the left. When I solo these, I want to make sure that the kit that I hear in here is the kit that I hear in the mix. Instead of the overhead smearing the snare signal by moving it to one side and the bass drum to the other, now the bass drum and snare are in the center just like the final mix where I put the bass drum and snare mono signals. But here we're using the Senken uh, CU44s. The beauty of these is they have two capsules. It has a low frequency capsule or a large capsule. And then it has a very small capsule like you will see in these smaller pencil mics. So you get the beauty of the low end and the top end and the crossover point is really smooth. So you get this just great sound. These are only cardioids, so if I'm looking for an Omni or figure eight, I will go to the ribbons or to the, uh, the ships. But for the rock kit and the pop kit, they were up a little bit higher. So uh, I get the bass drum, the snare. Now the snare is interesting. Over the years, I've tried various things and ended up with something that I and Elliot Shiner and my, uh, some of my other fellows in the Metal Alliance have called uh, the, the dual method where you're using a condenser and a dynamic mic and you just tape the two of them together so the capsules are aligned and then you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting the sharpness and crack of a condenser but at the same time you're getting that kind of analog crunchiness that comes in a dynamic mic. Making sure, if I can, uh, getting the capsules as close together as I can. And I do that by checking, doing a recording and checking the waveform and making sure that these two are bringing the signal in at exactly the same point, phase align. In this instance, I'm using a BNK 4011, uh, a terrific microphone. Um, but a little clean and sterile. So I add, uh, instead of an SM57 for the dynamic, there's this microphone called the B&O um, MK something or other. The idea here is that I place the snare mic facing where the stick is going to hit. Also with keeping in mind the polar patterns of these two mics, so I'm rejecting as much of the hi-hat as I can. If we go to the hi-hat, same deal here. What I normally do is I tip it this way, but what I wanna do is get as little of this into the microphone as I can. So I will move this so it's farther along towards the, the area where it rejects. When you're dealing with instruments in a close situation you have to be equally careful of not only where the mic is pointing but what it's rejecting each of these microphones should be reasonably safe from the other this is what we're using for the ambience of the kit the tom toms are the same um, i've tried everything on the toms and i keep coming back to these tiny little devils here the uh, Audio-Technica, these are ATM35s, but when the cymbals are very close to the tom-toms, you have to be very careful because if I put my microphone here, which is where I would normally want to do it, I'm going to get as much of this as I'm getting of this. Well, that's a problem because normally, especially in a, a pop or Broadway show, I'm going to end up EQing some top end on these toms. 
that's also going to EQ the, the symbols, which is going to make the symbols abnormally bright, especially in the area that I want to EQ here, which is about 3K, 2 or 3K. First is I will back pattern this to the symbol. Secondly, I still want to capture where he's hitting. So this is the cardioid pattern. We're rejecting here and face, we're still getting enough of the front of the stick. I also, when it's very close like this, or if I have to do this, end up putting even more of a pad here behind it just to take uh, the edge off the cymbals. Finally, when I get to the floor tom, I always like a big capsule on the floor tom. One, because I can, and two, because uh, that's generally not in the drummer's way. In this particular setup, the cymbals and crashes sound great. But if you're doing a jazz date or if you're doing a pop date and you really need that immediacy of the, of the ride cymbal, you're not going to get that from here. So what I do in addition is throw a microphone on the ride cymbal and uh, I can use that or not use that depending on, on the song or, or what I need. But that gives me the immediacy. So in the end, this is my sound. Then I add these into the mix. They should uh, sum very well because we've already been careful about pans. And then we add in the room mics and hopefully you will get a, a vibe as to what it sounds like at Power Station New England and the three fabulous rooms they have there. We've done ISO A, B and the main room and they're all incredible rooms. So uh, enjoy and uh, have yourself a lovely afternoon. <music>